Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Jobs. Good luck. Morning. Nice chair. Yeah, it's pretty good, huh? Um, so first of all, thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, you're not a habitué of these conferences, and so we really appreciate you being here. Uh, you were there at the beginning of uh, the digital personal computer revolution. You and Steve Wozniak developed what was the first really successful personal computer for the mass market, and that was 26 years ago, I think. 77. This spring. Apple II. And you've, uh, you've stayed with it all this time in different ways, different formats. You uh, run the most digital movie studio there is with uh, Pixar. And I have to say that they have a new movie coming out in a couple of days. But um, where do you think we are in the arc of this story of the PC, the internet, the whole, the whole digital deal? Um, well, the personal computer has been a pretty amazing thing in that it's morphed into these different things over the, over the years and the decades. So first, first, it was a hobbyist tool. Um, and the reason the Apple II was successful was because we saw that for every hardware hobbyist that wanted to put a hardware kit together, there were thousands of software hobbyists that didn't know how to do that, didn't have soldering irons, but wanted to mess with software. And uh, so we, we sold really the first ready-to-go personal computer. And uh, that's what it was for the early days. And then. Uh, uh, Bricklin and um, Frankston. Frankston. Who's Bob here? Frankston is here. I know I saw him last night. Uh, invented the first spreadsheet. And that kicked off something entirely new. And before long, the personal computer was being welcomed into business. And the whole productivity, the age of productivity began. And that's what really fueled a lot of the growth. Um, but then, as the personal computer sort of saturated that particular function, um, people were speaking of its plateau and even its demise in the, in the early 90s. Uh, the internet came along. And um, all of a sudden, the, the next great age of the personal computer started. And everyone replaced their personal computers with faster ones that could run these new web browsers. And everybody got on the internet. And the industry was very healthy for a while. And then, uh, you know, starting in, in early in this decade, uh, that had plateaued, and everyone was saying the personal computer would pass its prime. Uh, but we, we feel very strongly at Apple that there's a third great age of the personal computer coming. And it's, it's where the, the personal computer becomes sort of the, your digital hub. And we articulated this you know, three years ago. And um, a lot of people have said the same words since then, but, but, but hardly anybody's delivered on it. But it's slowly starting to happen. I think we've tried to deliver on that as well. And, and people say, well, what, what's that mean? And you know, if you, how many of you have a digital camera? Right. Well, you can't do anything with a digital camera without a personal computer. There's nothing to do with it. I mean, you look at the pictures on the tiny little display on the camera, that's about it. So your pictures are in your computer now. Uh, anyone under 25, their entire music library is in their personal computer now. It's not in CDs in some bookshelf in their living room. It's on their personal computer, and, uh, and hopefully on their iPod. And so. Uh, it's becoming the hub for your photography, your movies, your, your, your uh, uh, music, obviously. And, and it's really your, your you know, your, it's, it's, it's the number one uh, high-speed connection you have to the outside world in terms of data. So I, I think it's, it's starting to become integral to our digital lifestyle. And you think it will always remain there at the hub? Or do you think, uh, I mean, there's perennial talk about, well, the television will be a, a hub or a point of contact with your digital stuff. Um, things like the iPod. Uh, he makes a music player. Do you guys know that? The iPod. Um, why couldn't that have its own Wi-Fi connection to the internet and, and, it, and not require you to use the computer? Well, it can, but a personal computer, I mean, at, at its very basics, it's got a really big hard drive in it. It's got a really big display. It's got a really big keyboard. And it's got a really fat pipe to the internet. And it's got a reasonable processor in it that can run really big applications. So the iPod might be great and holds all your music, but we see it more as a satellite device because you'd never, you, you couldn't really do a music store on it, as an example, because the music store needs just more screen real estate. And these things fight each other. So if you want a compact thing you can put in your pocket, 
uh, unless there's a breakthrough in foldable displays over time or something like that, it's going to be hard to, to really browse a music store and find the music you want on the iPod itself, even if it has an internet connection. So since you've been back at Apple, it's been about, I think, what, six years? Not 97 you came back? Six years this 4th of July. You've had quite a few hit products. Uh, you've gotten uh, lots of critical praise, uh, not only in terms of, of the, the Mac, but the, the iPod also being uh, uh, generally regarded as by far the best um, music player. Uh, but the market share for Apple, and there's a whole history of reasons why Apple doesn't dominate the field, and we won't go over that, but the market share for Apple has not really increased dramatically. So why? <laughs> you're doing great products. You're actually, sure. you're, you're much more price competitive. In some cases, you're, uh, in, my, in my research, you're actually priced more aggressively than a Windows counterpart uh, in some of your models. <laughs> How come you're not doubling your market share or whatever? Well, we ask ourselves that a lot. Um, if, you, if you get a little surgical about it, what you see is that the markets that we serve, we serve many markets, but, but the three primary ones are consumer, um, education, and, and the creative professional market. Um, the problem that we've had is that uh, our creative professional market, you know, graphics houses, ad agencies, et cetera, et cetera, have been in the toilet for the last several years more so than the general market has. And so our creative pro market's been suffering. Secondly, education, uh, we've made some mistakes. And as you know, education is down the last three years. So two but of some of your rivals are, have gained ground on you in education, right? Well, actually, uh, some of our rivals have gained ground primarily by taking share away from their competitors. Okay. But we've made some mistakes, too. And so two of our three markets are down or depressed uh, in the consumer market, we've more than doubled share in the last year. Really? Yeah, really. What is so, your share in the consumer market? Uh, it know? depends who you talk to, but it's somewhere... I'm talking to you. Uh, it, <laughs> <laughs> our share of the consumer market is between 5 and 10%. Okay, good. Yeah. And uh, our stores have been phenomenal. We have almost 60 retail stores open, which were the best buying experience for a personal computer on the planet, and, uh, and doing quite well. We've had over 15 million people, 15 million visitors through them since we opened the first store two years ago. Um, a lot of people think, given this string of, of uh, great products you've done, that, uh, and given the iPod, that's a portable device, that you, know, you should be making a PDA. You should, people, there's constantly rumors, you're going to make a PDA, you're going to make a tablet, you're going to make a cell phone. Can we just touch on those? Sure. Because there's a lot of excitement around those in, in, generally in the industry. So let's just start with, say, a tablet. Are you going to make a tablet? What do you think about the tablet? No plans at the current time to make a tablet, no. Uh, you saw your old friend Bill Gates up here uh, mm -hmm. uh, being really enthusiastic about it last night. What do you think about it? Well, I, I mean, I think it's great that they're trying. Um, but but it, turns out, <laughs> it turns out that I, I would characterize it a little bit differently than Bill. Um, Bill characterizes it as a device you can take to, to meetings and take notes. Well, I see people with notebook computers at every meeting I go to taking notes. So I don't think that's what it's about. I think it's about handwriting input versus a keyboard. And um, handwriting recognition's been tried over and over again. And even when you get it really good, it turns out Apple, believe it or not, after all that pain that they went through with Newton, has the best handwriting technology in the world now. It's way better than anything else. Really? Yeah. You know the problem? It doesn't matter. It's really slow to write stuff. You know, you could never keep up with your email if you had to write it all out. And so it turns out that people want keyboards. I mean, when I started in this business, the, one of the biggest challenges was people couldn't type. You know, and, and, and one day we realized that death would eventually take care of this. And <laughs> so <clears throat> people know how to type now. And, and they, if, you, if, you, if you do email of any volume, you've got to have a keyboard. And so if you've got a device that's a I don't know. Bill said it's really easy to do a handwritten email last night. <laughs> I, you know, so we look at the, we look at the tablet, and, 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 and we think it's going to fail. You think the tablet's going to fail? Yes, we do. What about the tablet as a reading device? Because my mm -hmm. own feeling, having tested it, I didn't give it a great review. Mm -hmm. But what I said was, and I believe this, its actual strength in a funny way is that it's a much more natural way to read, like mm -hmm. a long sure. a web article or a long Word document or PDF file or something, than, than a clamshell. It, it's really true. If you've got a bunch of rich guys who can afford their third computer, you know, they've got a <laughs> desktop, they've got a portable, and now they're going to have one of these to read with, that's your market. OK. People accuse us of niche markets. <laughs> <laughs> what, 
What about a PDA? I mean, I would point out for those who don't have an iPod that actually they have, even though it's designed hardware and software as a music player, you can put your calendar and your contacts on your iPod now, and you've even improved that a little with the new mm -hmm. ones. What about a PDA? Well, you know, my email address is out there, and so I get an email every time somebody, you know, goes to the bathroom in Iowa. <laughs> and uh, and we've got, I get a lot of emails about, about that. Um, over the years, we have tremendous pressure to do a PDA, and we, we thought about this a lot. Uh, and what we, what we decided was that we believe that for everyone using, a, for all the universe of people using a PDA, 90% uh, of them really just want to get the information out. Only 10% want to do major input on this thing. And so if what they really want is a repository for data that they can get out, occasionally putting in a phone number or correcting an address, um, we believe the cell phones are going to do that. And we saw that several years ago. We just see the, the curve of cell phones going like this. You're going to have to have a phone in your pocket. So that's going to have to be the device that carries this information. And we started working, rather than doing a, a, a we didn't think that we were going to be successful in the cell phone business because of the carriers. Um, I mean, we're not the greatest at selling to the Fortune 500, and there's 500 of them, 500 CIOs that are orifices you have to go through to get to the Fortune 500. In the, in the, in the, in the cell phone business, there's, there's five, five. You know, in this country. So, uh, you know, we don't even like 500. We'd rather run an ad for millions of people and let everybody make up their own mind. You can imagine what we thought about five. And so we decided we might not be successful in that business. So what we've done instead is we've written, I think, some of the best software in the world to start syncing data from your personal computer onto your cell phone. Anyone who's used a Palm uh, knows that, that there are two great revolutions in the Palm. The one was the, 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 you know, the, the, the focused function and form factor, but the second was the dock, the cradle that allowed you to sync it to your PC so that if you lost your palm, you didn't lose your life. You could buy another one, stick it in there, and refresh it, and off, to, off you'd go. And, um, and so we, we believe that that mode is what cell phones need to get to. That's the mode we copied for the, the iPod, as an example. Where your personal computer is your hub, all your data is safe and secure there. You can enter it on a big screen with a real keyboard, et cetera, et cetera. Sync it to your phone. You can still make changes on your phone. It's a little painful with that small keyboard, but you can do it on occasion. And yet, for 90% of the people plus, they're going to be able to get all the information they want out of that phone. And that's the direction we see it going. Well, so are you working with, the, with, with Nokia yeah. and, and Motorola and the other cell yes. phone handset makers? Yeah, absolutely. Trying to make this happen? Absolutely. Because really, I, I, unless you're talking about a, a combo like the Trio, uh -huh. which is, it has a lot of PDA uh, DNA in it, Right. A regular phone, the calendar and the, and the address book in there are terrible. Yeah, I know. They are terrible, but they're improving at a fairly rapid rate right now. So I think they're going to get there. So all of your fans who are predicting a PDA, predicting a Right. We chose instead phone. to do the iPod instead of a PDA. That was our, that we put our resources behind that. What about, uh, uh, how many iPods have you sold, by the way? Um, well, I don't know. As of today, we'd sold 700,000 a few months ago. And the new one's on fire, so I suspect we'll you know, probably sell our millionth iPod sometime later this summer. What's the next step for that? Uh, is it video? Is it photos? I mean, do I, why, don't, why shouldn't I want to? There are already a couple on the market that right. uh, can show videos and photos. Yeah, you know, we've clearly got stuff like that in the lab, too. And, and it turns out that you know, watching movies on a tiny little screen is really not very much fun. Um, and and you, you, again, get into that, that fight between form factor, you want to put it in your pocket, uh, and, and you want a giant screen to watch movies on. So right now, the best way to watch movies on a portable device is to buy a personal computer and stick a DVD in it. And that's, what, that's the most popular way to watch DVDs when you're away from your television. Um, and I'm not convinced that people want to watch movies on a tiny little display they carry around. And so photos, we'll your family photos? Photos are nice. What you really want to be able to do is plug it into the television when you get somewhere and show somebody your photos on your television. That kind of stuff will come over time. But one of the, you know, I paraphrase Bill Clinton when I, when I am in meetings like this and just keep saying, it's the music, stupid. It's the music. It's about music. People have, what's interesting is that, you know, putting photos on an iPod, putting movies on an iPod, these are speculative markets. Will people want to watch movies on a little portable device? Who knows? Somebody will try. We'll find out. But music, music's been around for a long time, you know, good tens of thousands Pr of years. Prior to 1977. Yeah, prior you? to 1977. And um, it will be around for an awful long time. And people have had portable ways to listen to music for a long time, and it's huge. 
So this is not a speculative market. It's a real tangible market. And um, I think if we can bring some value to that market, uh, then we'll succeed. So how come you were, the, you were the company that was the latest, the last to figure out MP3s and music? That's interesting. If we it's were so the, universal and so yeah. obvious, I mean, you know. May, we may, maybe weren't quite the last, but we were certainly near the last. And the reason was, was because we were focused on video. What happened was Apple invented this technology called Firewire. And they licensed it to all these companies. And all the Japanese consumer electronics companies licensed it, put it in their digital, new generation of digital, then new di generation of digital camcorders. And the only company that forgot to put it in something was Apple. So we decided <laughs> to, to put it in to the, 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 one of the early iMacs. And, um, and we, we, we got some video editing software written. And we were very excited about that. iMovie. So, iMovie, exactly. And so the idea is you plug your camcorder into the computer. Yeah, no cards, no nothing. It was pristine digital quality. The movie just appears and you can edit it. Yes, and, and, you could, and, and a mere mortal could edit it without reading a manual. And so we came out with iMovie, and it was a really big hit. But then what do you do with your movie? You put it back on the camcorder, uh, and, and you, know, you, you can send a tape to, to you know, your friends, but they might not have a camcorder to play it. So we clearly saw that the, 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 um, the brass ring was to be able to write a DVD that you could send to you know, your friends or grandma or whoever. And um, we pioneered the, the drives that could write DVDs. And we worked with Pioneer, who was way ahead of anybody else. And we wrote the, most of the software for that. And we wrote a software package called iDVD, which could you know, make DVDs. And we were the first ones out with that. And we were so focused on that that this music thing happened around the side, and we weren't paying enough attention to it. But we finally, you know, finally got hit over the head with a brick. And, and, and saw that it was happening, and then we, we, we came on fairly strong. We put CD burners in almost every machine. We wrote um, iTunes, which you know, some think is the best jukebox software in the world, and, uh, and that led us uh, you know, in less than a year to the iPod. So we, we came on pretty strong when we, when we came on. And some people in the record business actually didn't realize you were late. They thought you were leading the charge to stealing music because of your ad slogan at the time, right? Right. We ran an ad. Um, we called it Concert. And the, and, the, and the slogan was Rip, Mix, Burn. And it turns out, you know, you laugh. And there were, bill laugh there were billboards that said that, right? Rip, oh, yeah. Mix, no, burn, we spent yeah. lots of money on this. Magazine and covers. Magazines, billboards, and TV commercials. And it turns out what rip means, if you, if you know young people that do this, is the word came from ripping the bits off a CD and putting them on your hard drive. That was where that phrase came from, which means you have a physical CD, right? Theoretically yours. And you rip the bits off and you put them on your hard drive. Um, some industry executives who did not have teenagers living at home, uh, <laughs> especially some in Hollywood, thought rip meant rip off. And they did not do their customary homework. And they, 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 they you know, some of them even went to Washington and testified uh, and, and held us up in effigy. But in reality, uh, what it meant was, Get CDs and put them on your hard drive. So now you're in the music business, right? I mean, oh, what, three bit, weeks yeah. ago you, you announced what um, I think is the first usable, attractive, legal music service for downloading songs. Um, you're a computer company. Why are you in that business? What's the deal there? Well, again, the definition of what a computer company is is morphing. A you know, computer company is a company that cares deeply about digital photography now. A computer company is a company that cares deeply about digital movie making. I mean, we, between iMovie and a pro product we have called Final Cut Pro, we're the largest video editing supplier in the world now. We're the largest pro video editing supplier with Final Cut Pro, much bigger than Avid now. And we, you know, our stuff is used by more consumers than anyone else. So we care deeply about video editing, and, and we care deeply about music. And, and as you know, um, you know, Napster and Kazaa hit the music industry like a tsunami. They didn't know what hit them for a few years. And, and you know, everybody's threatening to sue everybody else, and everybody's at war with everybody else. And we looked at this, and we thought, gosh, there's got to be a middle path out of this. And when we did the iPod, um, we tried to walk a middle path. We said, you know, this thing could be the coolest thing ever invented, and it could also be a theft shuttle. And, and, and we're optimists. We're, we're, we believe that 80% of the people stealing music don't really want to steal music. We think they'd rather be legal if somebody offered them a competitive, compelling way to be legal. And we felt that, that um, most of the people using an iPod really would want to use it in an honest way. So we put software in there uh, that, means, that, that, tr that makes it so it, it's not so easy to make it a theft shuttle for a normal, honest person. You could say that you crippled it for an honest person because yes. it is perfectly legal 
to take your music from an iPod and move it from one of your computers to another. There's nothing illegal about that. We and did, you didn't allow that. We crippled it in some ways to try to walk that middle path. Everybody has, to, both sides have to give up something to walk the middle path. And we did. We made it so that it will only sync with one version of iTunes. So if you take your iPod over to your friend's house, it'll put all their music on it, but it'll take yours off. If you take it back to your house, it won't put their music on your computer. It'll put yours back on and take theirs off. Unless you download what are 20 free utilities. If you want to get around it, you can. Right. With all this talk of DRMs and this and that, I guarantee you there's nothing that can't be hacked. The question is, will it keep honest people honest? Will it give them a nudge in the honest direction? And I think we did walk a really good middle path with the iPod. I think a lot of people have held it up and said, hey, this is pretty good and on both sides of that. When you did that, were you already thinking ahead that you wanted to do deals with the labels to do your music service? It had crossed our mind, but it we hadn't started yet. <laughs> So you're able to say to them, look how we constructed the iPod and all that. Yeah, but as, as Bill said last night, I mean, Apple also is one of the few companies in our industry that has a lot of intellectual property. You know, I mean, other companies don't. But Microsoft, Apple, we have a lot of intellectual property. And software looks a lot like music, you know, bits on a disc to steal. We don't want people stealing our software either. So about three weeks ago, you launched this uh, iTunes Music Store. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of things that differentiated, I think, from the other services. But one of the big ones is that you got better <coughs> digital rights from the labels, right. so that your customers at your store can do more with the songs they buy. They can actually buy them instead of renting them, and they Correct. have some freedom to do it. Uh, how did you do, how did, why did they do that for you? Was it because you were in the mo movie business? Was it because you were charming? Was it, um, I mean, because they figured the Mac is only a tiny part of the world, it doesn't sure. matter? Um, you know, you gotta step back even a step further. One of the things I learned at Pixar is the technology industries and the content industries do not understand each other. Um, in Silicon Valley and at most technology companies, I swear most people still think the creative process is a bunch of guys in their early 30s sitting around on an old couch drinking beer thinking up jokes. They re no, they really do. That's, what, that's how television's made, they think. That's how movies are made. And I've seen from Pixar that couldn't be further from the truth. The, the folks on the creative side work as hard as any technology folks I've ever seen in my life. They're just as disciplined. The process is just as, 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 as difficult and disciplined as, as an engineering process is. And the contrapositive is true, too, which is people in Hollywood and in the content industries, they think technology is something that you just write a check for and buy. They do not believe that they're, they don't understand the creative element of technology. They don't understand that all technology is not created equal. They don't understand that this stuff is, is created by people working extraordinarily hard with passion, just like the creative talent that they have. And so the, these are like ships passing in the night. I mean, one of the greatest achievements of Pixar was it brought these two cultures together and got them working side by side. And so when we looked at the music industry, most of the folks in the tech industries thought the record companies were completely brain dead. You know, why haven't they jumped on this new business model? Why don't they understand where things are going? Well, it turns out that record companies, the most important thing they do is not distribute music. That's not what they do. It's not even market music. It's picking which of 500 people are gonna be the next Sheryl Crow. That's what they do. And some of them do it quite well. And it's an intuitive process. There's not enough data. But they have to pick. And they have to decide who to invest in. And they manage a portfolio. And some of them do it awfully well. And if they don't do that well, the rest of it doesn't matter. Right? So that's what they do well. And people that do well at that end up running the music companies, the good ones anyway. And so it's, it's not surprising that they didn't understand Napster. It's not surprising that they didn't understand that distributing their content over the internet was the next big wave. And we went to them and we talked to them about this and we made a lot of, and they, and they told us we were all wet. This was a few years ago. And we made a lot of predictions. We said, we think MusicNet and Press Play are going to fail and here's why and this and this and this and this. And they said, well, you're all wrong, get out of here. And about nine months later, we started to get some phone calls. And we went back to them and they said, you know, talk to us some more because you guys were right about some of this stuff. And we started talking to them about this middle path and about how um, their content needed to be protected from getting back onto the internet for honest people, but their real competitor was Kazaa. 
That was their competitor. And Kazaa was offering unlimited CD burning. Kazaa was offering an ability to have your music where it never went away if you stopped paying your subscription fee. Uh, Kazaa was offering the ability to put your music on a portable player. And if they, if they were not willing to offer the user those kinds of rights, they couldn't compete with Kazaa. They might as well just put a big sign up that says Kazaa this way. And, and, and we, 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 they got it. These are smart guys. And I think one of the things that, that appealed to them about Apple was that you know, we, we do have a, a smaller sandbox than the whole market, so if the thing went radioactive, it would only uh, go radioactive on 10% uh, you know, of the market. And another thing I think that appealed to them was that we could do the whole thing. You know, we made the operating system. We could write the applications. We made the computers. We made the iPod. And, and we, could, we could control the whole thing. I think a third thing that appealed to them was we were a large company with a lot of money in the bank, and if we did something wrong, they knew who to sue. Um, hard to sue Kazaa. Uh, they, they're trying. Hard to sue Kazaa. Uh, hard to sue some of these small companies. There's nothing there. Well, I know you're very shy and you usually don't like to do demos, and you're reluctant to promote Apple products, but <laughs> everybody's heard about this store, and I'm betting that most of our audience has never seen it because for some reason they may not be Mac users. Right. I mean, you know, I How know. many of you have never seen the iTunes Music Store? If you could raise your hand. So would you give us a few minutes, uh, okay, like sure. a five minute demo, and I'll we'll be take real a look quick. at it? Um, so, one of the most important things is, is in the iTunes Music Store, you get to buy your music. People have bought um, LPs, they bought cassettes, they bought CDs, and they want to buy downloads. People don't want to rent their music. Uh, even the subscription services now, if you want to download on top of the subscription, you've got to pay money. You've got to pay 99 cents or 49 cents or whatever it is. And to burn a CD, most of them charge you every time you burn the same track on a CD. So if you have your favorite song, you pay $9.99 a month, plus you pay 50 cents to download it every time you want to burn it on a CD. So if you want to put it on 100 CDs, you're paying a lot of money for that. So people want to buy their music and own it. And that's what the iTunes Music Store lets you do. Second thing is, you can't do this with a web browser. Uh, web browsers are really slow. They're not very interactive. And so you have to have a client application. If you're going to have a client application, the last thing you want is for it to put your downloaded music in some random folder somewhere that you've got to go dig out and then drag into your jukebox. So we decided to build it right into the jukebox itself. So here's iTunes. This is our jukebox. And what we did was we put over here a music store. And you push this thing, and boom, that's the music store. You're in it. When you download music, it puts it right in your jukebox. So with the screen we're looking at now, this is coming from a server at Apple. This is coming from a server at the Apple. The first screen was songs you have on your hard disk yeah. that you These own. are the songs I have on my hard disk, and I own them. And this is our jukebox, and you can just you know, play one. And you can go to the music store now. Here's the home page of the music store. And what it features is it shows us our top song, uh, song downloads and top album downloads over here. And uh, so I can get to songs over here. It shows us a few featured songs, new releases. New release Tuesday happened yesterday. This is when the music industry releases their new songs. You can look at those. Uh, here's some featured artists over here. And so let me just go through a way of finding some music. Uh, you can go over here and say, um, you know, your top album download, uh, Jack Johnson. You know, here's an album of his. And in Jack Johnson, we can, you know, just go to a song and play it. Now, this is a really big deal. There are free. 30, there's a free, high-quality, 30-second preview of every song on the store. And it turns out 30 seconds is a long time for a song. It's like 20% of a song. And so you can listen to what you might want to buy and move all around, and every single song has a preview. We also show you, the, you know, the top downloads of that particular artist. So we'll go to another album here. Just click on these things. And up on the top here, it shows us the breadcrumbs, the home page, Rock, Jack Johnson, and here's his album. I can go to Jack Johnson if I want. And we'll go to his artist page right here. Here's an artist page for Jack. We can go to his website. We can see all of his albums. He's only got three albums out. He's a young artist. We can watch a video that he's got right here. We can stream a video if we want to. OK, but the heart of this is that you can just buy the songs when you want them, right? Well, let's, yes, let's go back and find some songs some other ways. So we can go to an album here. We can say, um, you know, here's an old Fleetwood Mac album. And we have some exclusive tracks from artists that you can't even get on CDs. So these are some, some cuts from Fleetwood Mac that you can't even get on a CD. 
And to buy one of these tracks, all you do is you push buy song. I have to type in my account here. <laughs> Whoa, OK. <laughs> <laughs> they don't yeah, know who you are, Steve. They don't Steve. know who I am. OK, this should work. Try one of your other passwords. I only have one. Yeah, try Yahoo. I'll get it. OK. Anyway, you'd hit that download button, and you'd download the song. Wayne, you know a password that I don't know? No? Such, such is life. Uh, so let me go back to the home page. Yeah. What's that? Jingle. Oh, OK. Great. <laughs> Everybody got that down? Great. <laughs> so I push a button. It connects. And I'm downloading the song. So now you can't take it back. You click. That's that right. Song's you getting click, downloaded. you own it. We have one click downloads. We have an online store that does between a billion and $2 billion a year. We have one click shopping. We're the only other folks in Amazon that do. We have extended that to one click downloads. You click the button, builds your credit card, downloads the song. So if your seven year old gets on this and starts clicking, yeah. you're hosed. Well, you have a lot of great music. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> OK, and so now I can go to my purchase music playlist, and there's my song. Uh, and I've got, you know, album art here and whatever else I need. Now, that song now is on this Mac. That's on the hard it's disk. It's on the hard disk. I own it. Nobody's ever going to take it away from me. If I quit paying a monthly subscription fee, I can burn as many CDs as I want. I can put it on as many iPods as I want. I own it. And you can put it on how many computers? Up to three Macs. No Windows computers? Not yet. OK. But we're going to have a version of Windows by the end of the year. And what if I upload this to Kazaa? Uh, it will only play on those three Macs. So somebody else can download it, but won't be very won't interesting. Won't be very interesting. Yeah. Okay. So now let me go search for some music. I can search for, uh, uh, you know, soak up the sun, uh, and I can just type it in here, and boom, there's that album off of Sheryl Crow, or that song, excuse me. And I can go back here and again go to Sheryl Crow's page. I can go to that album. I can see all the uh, the music that she's got. Pick any album. Go there, plenty of the songs I want. Now, there are some big artists you don't have on here. Yes, there are. I mean, you have, what, 200,000, 210,000, something like that? 200, we, yeah, we have over 200,000 tracks. We don't have the Beatles yet. Some of the big artists have carve-outs in their contracts that don't allow the labels to distribute them online. We visited with many, many artists personally. Fortunately, most of them use Macs, and they all have iPods. And so they were very, very trusting of us and let us put their music on here. But we don't have it all. We're getting more every single week. I want to show you one other thing on here that I love. Just, um, you can type in a song. Whoops, you got to know how to type. One for the road. It's an old song, One for the Road. And it's just amazing when you start getting these large music libraries, what you can see in here. Like, here's a bunch of versions of it. Here's Willie Nelson. Ella Fitzgerald. Henry Belafonte. Harry Belafonte. So Billy Holiday. So Bette Midler, you name it. And, one more. and of course, Frank Sinatra. I hope you didn't mind my band in your ear. And if you wanted these, you just click that. You just click that buy button and you own them. And uh, one last way to find music is browse, which we've never seen before on, on anything uh, online, uh, which is all the genres here. So you can pick, uh, you know, I want uh, rock and roll. You pick the rock genre. And this lists all the artists. You can find any one. And uh, you, know, you just pick any one. And it shows you all their albums. You can pick all their albums and see all their songs right here. Or you can pick any album and just see the songs on that album. And uh, can we try one more thing? Sure. For some reason that I don't understand, Kara Swisher's favorite song is Copacabana by Barry Mar Manilow. <laughs> you have no idea how hard it was for me to stop her from playing that as one of the songs here how at the conference. How do you spell it? Just put Manilow maybe and you okay, can find fine. it. I don't know. Just wondering if you M have it. M-A-N-I-L-O-W. Is it a big seller on the Apple Store? I wouldn't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And so we can sort by song, and we can go down here. And uh, he's got 195 songs on here. And there's oh, two there versions of Copacabana. Copacabana. And uh, am I right? I mean, you know, there it is. 
great. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's great. Thank you. All right. Just take some questions. All right, we have time for some questions. A few. Please come to the mics. Well, one of the other things I wanted to say about this that's really fun is, of course, we've gotten a lot of questions, are you going to sell videos this way? And maybe someday videos will be in the future, especially when we all get more bandwidth to our homes. But one of the great things about music is that you can deconstruct it down to these little 99-cent morsels. And at 99 cents, you know, you can buy three songs for the price of a Starbucks latte. And so it's really, it's kind of wonderful. You hear something on the radio, you get into work, you buy it. Let me, let me ask you one more thing before we go to the questions. This looks great, and you have demoed it before, I think we could tell. But everybody's going to have this, right, by the end of the year? You're going to have it on Windows. Uh, our friend Rob Glazer, who's here, he has a music service. He's going to have it on Windows. Uh, not the kind of thing they have now, but something like this. Uh, I read in the Wall Street Journal that Amazon's going to have it. Microsoft is trying to do it. So you, you no longer, you, you, know, you look cool, you look great. You're on the covers of magazines, you get big articles. But that's a six-month phenomenon, right? At the end of the year, you're just one of the guys. Everybody has it. Well, that's assuming it's really easy to do. And um, what we found, maybe these guys were a lot smarter than us. They probably are. But we found it's pretty hard to really do. really believe that. I, I don't know. We'll find out. Um, we think it's really hard to do. Um, it's really hard to, to get the labels to give you the rights that you need. And I, I don't see them sprinkling those rights around everywhere, letting a thousand flowers grow quite yet. Um, it's really hard to write software you know, and, and do a good job at it. Uh, so you know, this is not something that can be done well on a web browser. Um, it, you need a client application, and you need a jukebox. You've got to own a jukebox, so that kind of cuts it down a little bit. So we've got Music Match. They have yeah, a jukebox. Music Match Real has a jukebox. Real and Microsoft and others. So it, it gets you down to a handful of players, and it's, it's an awful lot of work. And then you might say, you know, it would be great if you could put it on portable players. And you, know, you might want to put it on the most popular portable player, which is an iPod. And so you know, we're, we like to sell iPods, so we're really open to working with those folks. But you know, so far, very few of them have even come and asked for that. And, and so we'll find out. We'll find out. But I, I think it might be a little harder than it seems. Yes, ma'am. You talked about um, handwriting and um, keyboard. How about speech as a new interface? These are the talk about for years. Um, you know, I, they, the, the last part of that question is, is exactly right. I've, I've, I've been in this industry almost 30 years, and it's, speech has always been five years away. It's been constant time to completion, just moving along five years away. And, most of the really smart people in speech I know have gotten out of the field. It's, it's like nuclear fusion. Um, it, a lot of bright people went into it, and, and, and people now think it's a ways away. Now, you can, do, you can do adequate speech today, but it means you're correcting a lot of stuff. If you just have you know, even a 1% error, it drives you nuts, because it turns out you can speak a lot of words in a, you know, a five-minute interval. So, it's got to be very accurate, and so far no one's come up with the technology. I mean, Apple's got a very, we got a speech group working on stuff. Microsoft has a group, that, m a lot of great work's being done in academia, but it doesn't look like it's going to be real anytime soon. I wish it was different. Yes, sir. Uh, Steve, in addition to music and video, Apple has been one of the early, early leaders and proponents of Wi-Fi mm -hmm. with the airport. What are you currently planning as the, the equivalent of the music store for Wireless. Um, well, you're correct. Apple was the first computer company to ship uh, really a, a low-cost Wi-Fi device um, with, with Airport uh, three, three and a half years ago, maybe three. And we, we've sold a lot of Wi-Fi products. Um, we were the first ones to ship 802.11g at the beginning of this year, uh, which is a 54 megabit per second version uh, of 802.11, which is com backwards compatible with B. And G is clearly going to be the next standard. A lot of folks made a lot of noise about A, but A is, A is going to fail. And G is going to be the, the next one, because it's compatible with everything that's out there, and A is not. And we're shipping a whole lot of that. Um, so you know, we're, we're building it into all of our computers. We have for a few years now. And we've built it into the software so that it's completely seamless now. And uh, that's what we're doing. I think like any network, it'll just disappear. And it'll just be there for you. Except in this room except in this room. Uh, Steve, the um, internet piracy has been blamed for a lot of the decline in sales in the music industry. Um, but as, as I think about it from, from their perspective, much of their growth has come from essentially unwanted bundling, 
for a long period of time where you bought an album that had 12 or 13 or 14 songs, two of which you really wanted, and the rest you really wouldn't buy on an a la carte basis. If you look at the margin structure of that business versus what, what will happen in an a la carte universe where you can buy things individually, uh -huh. it seems like there's a huge leg down yet in margins for that business. If you're successful, and if the industry is successful in this, what happens with EMI teetering on the edge of bankruptcy today? What happens to the industry, or, or does it just radically uh, evaporate? Well, you know, that is the conventional wisdom, but I don't think it's true. Um, and, and, and it turns out, you're right, a lot of the music companies, uh, most of the music companies are losing a lot of money right now. Um, what we found so far in, in, in four weeks of operation uh, is that over half the tracks we've sold, we sold over three million tracks, over half the tracks we've sold were bought as albums. Isn't that amazing? Making it so easy to buy a 99 cent song, over half the tracks we've sold so far have been sold as albums. And what do albums cost typically? Uh, they t we, we, we made the, the, the song pricing uniform at 99 cents. The albums float a little bit based on what we buy them for from the labels. So they're $7.99 to, to $11, $12.99, but almost all of them are $9.99. And don't you think maybe that this high rate of album purchase is just because you're albums at the very beginning of this, people are kind of thinking in terms of albums, but, but as he said, maybe over time, you know, it'll it'll be lower and lower and lower, and people will just buy all. I, I think the singles. answer is nobody knows, but I, I my personal belief, and this is just a guess, is that the labels will be lowering album prices over time to keep enticing you to buy the albums, and that a significant share of the songs sold will continue to be albums. The other interesting thing that we've learned, though, is is that is that the record labels you can only buy about twenty percent of a catalog that a record label owns, right? Like if you take Warner great record company, you can only buy about 20% of their songs. Why is that? Because the rest of them don't sell enough for the record stores to carry the CDs. They won't carry the inventory. So 80% of music you, we've never heard over the last you know, few decades. It's in, a, it's in a vault somewhere, I hope, um, but it's not on the record store shelves. Well, when you don't have inventory, like in an online store, all of a sudden that catalog can open up and you can find stuff you've, you've never heard before. And I, I expect that the catalogs are going to be worth a lot. Tim. Um, I'd be interested in your response to a question that uh, Walt asked Bill last night. But if you were 17 years old and starting all over again, what would you put your bets on? Um, intellectually, I mean, when I was 17 years old, I didn't imagine I would be in technology, so I don't know. But Intellectually, the most exciting thing to me is, is you know, biosciences. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent lead-in. Has is Apple thinking at all about using this architecture of these distributed devices having centralized information, making that information more personal in that area of medicine or biosciences or biomechanical devices, anything at all to basically help individuals? In that realm. Uh, we haven't so far. A really, really good old friend of mine, really smart person I know, suggested that to me just yesterday. Um, and uh, you know, I certainly think it's some, something our industry should take a look at. But I don't think there's a lot of work going on today. Thanks. I'd be interested in hearing since you came back to a struggling Apple six years ago. What's the hardest decision you've had to make in the last six years? Um, always the hardest decision I think anybody leading an organization makes is to let people go. And at the beginning at Apple, it was pretty tough. Um, Apple was, was in worse shape than I thought when I joined. I, I just come back temporarily at the beginning. And um, the individual contributors were unbelievable. I, I asked a lot of them, why in the heck did you stay? And, uh, and they had a phrase that I'd heard several times. They said, well, we bleed six colors. Um, but the, the folks that were, were less good was the management. And, and we had to, had to change management of the company. And so we had to let people go. And, and you know, when you're, when you're a little younger and you don't have a family of your own, um, maybe it's a little easier. You don't think about it as much. But when you start to have a family of your own and kids, you realize that the person you're laying off has got to go home and tell their family they don't have a job. And it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough. So that was, I think, the hardest thing I've had to do in the last many years. Now, fortunately, you know, we, we got that out of the way in the first year. And, and our competitors have laid off tens of thousands of people in the last two and a half years, and we haven't. We haven't had, had no big layoffs. 
and we decided to innovate, innovate our way through this downturn. And so we're turning out more products now than we ever have in the company's history. Um, but, but the first year was very hard. Yeah. Thanks very much, Steve. Thank you, Walt. Well.